morning, everyone. Hey, guys. We're here at Dream Center Las Vegas. I'm Frank. This is Linda. We're the pastors of, of this campus. And, and we just want to tell you how much we thank you and love you for being part of, of this ministry. I know that some of us can't make it here personally because of this whole COVID thing. But uh, we know that also that you're, you're still wanting to be part of what we're doing and the fruitfulness and the, and the things that we're doing here at Dream Center. We literally give out uh, tens of thousands of pounds of food away every week to, to help thousands of families to be able to make it. And, and as you know, in this challenging time that we're in, that there are so many families that are hurting and they're challenged with just feeding their kids yeah. and, and paying their bills. And so here at Dream Center, we love to teach about how reallocation works. And so we say the money you save on the food that we give you three times a week, pay your bills. So you can be happy when you're eating your dinner at night with your family. And so we would, um, we're inviting you to participate and maybe even partner with us uh, through giving online so that we can keep this ministry running. How many people know that the, the giving's gone down, the attendance has gone down, we are mandated by the governor to only allow so many people in. And so that's been a challenge, but you know what? We're pushing through, we're, we're pushing through. Yeah, and we're gonna continue doing what God has called us to do, and that is to share the love of God, the compassion of God. The, uh, and, and we really believe in, um, you know, representing uh, the Lord in a way that uh, people will know that he is good and that goodness will bring them into a place where they can receive all of his benefits, mm -hmm. all of his goodness. And so would you consider helping us to help other people? If you would, uh, we would love to have you pray with us for one and pray for us because we haven't stopped um, uh, and haven't missed a beat. As a matter of fact, we're giving more now than we um, did before the Corona um, 19 virus. And so if you can pray, that would be great. And also if you could find in your heart to give so other families that, uh, that don't have the ability to feed their children, to feed their families and to pay their bills, we can help them. And so we love you and we thank you. And baby, do you have anything you want to share? I just want to say, you know what? God is in control of everything and he is our provider. He's our Jehovah Jireh. And uh, don't be fearful to give. We give even though things get a little bit tight. But God always shows up. He always blesses us. He always gives us everything that we need. So I just want to encourage you to be brave, to be bold in your giving. And just watch and see the return that God's going to give you in your life. Yeah. We love you here at Dream Center, and we thank you. Come visit us sometime, all right? Trust the Lord and, yeah. and in the midst of the battle, and watch and see if he doesn't show himself faithful. That's it. God bless you all. Bye. For the month of October, our sermon series is called The Challenge. Who out there has had a very challenging 2020? Like Pastor Frank does, raise my foot too. Saying that it's been a challenge is an understatement, but we all come to the fork in the road where we have a decision. We can either break through or break down. Now in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, it says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. How encouraging is that? Stick with us every Sunday in October as we discuss the challenge. Thanks for joining us here at Dream Center Las Vegas. We're so happy you're here. Please check us out on all social media and at our website, dreamcenterlasvegas.com. Stay tuned. This message is going to be bomb. Let's go. All right, so Tiffany did a better job of reading 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 than I ever could. But we're going to do it again because we're talking about the challenge. And I, I just, before we get into this, I, like when you hear the challenge, what do you hear? What does that mean? When you hear the challenge. We're going to pray, but I want you to and read that verse. What does that mean to you when you hear the word the challenge? What does challenge mean to you? Because it's a, it's a noun and a verb, right? The challenge, or I challenge you. So you can challenge someone in a way that is actually positive. You can challenge someone in a way that's negative. You can talk about a challenge like it's a problem. But when you hear that word, 
what are your emotions in your mind? What do you actually think? Because as I've been praying, yeah. All right. I like the way you think. I like the way you think. So, uh, so that passage. Uh, now, I'm teaching out of the New Living Translation. I know it's not, I, get, I understand, it's not the most literal, accurate translation, word for word. It's actually of, of the original text. But it speaks in ways that I kind of understand. It helps me. I read New King James Version too, but it really helps me to kind of refer to the New Living Translation because it talks a little bit closer to how I talk. Is that all right? So 2 Corinthians 4, 7, 8, New Living Translation. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Lord, I just thank you that, yeah, look, you promised that this was not always going to be easy for two reasons. One, because the rain falls on the just and the unjust, so if stuff happens. And two, you said it's going to be extra hard for us because we're with you, and the world is going to take everything they hate about you out on us. So, Lord, we, just, we know it's hard, but we're going to talk about what to do. So, Lord, I just ask right now that you'll comfort the hearts and minds of everyone here, Lord, that we'll lay our burdens down, and we're not going to allow anything to, stop, to keep us from getting to the finish line of what you purpose for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Pray that everyone will hear something they need to hear today. So, perplexed. Oxford Dictionary says baffled or puzzled. So, here he says we're perplexed, we're baffled, we're puzzled. We don't always know what's going on, but we're not in despair, which means utter loss of hope. <laughs> so... How many have been in a moment where you're like, I have no idea what to even say about this. I have no idea what's going on. You ever been there? I have been there. I call it yesterday. I call it 843 this morning. I don't know what's going on. Lord, I don't get it. I don't understand. I thought it was going to be different. So clearly you see something I don't see. But am I going to allow that to move me to despair? Because that's what he says. So uh, we just got permission. Do you guys know who wrote Corinthians? Paul. Paul wrote Corinthians. And in here he said it is okay to be, to not know, to not even have a clue. To look at this and go, I don't understand. To be confused. To look at this and go, Lord, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's okay to be there. He says, but we're not going to allow ourselves to get to the point where we have an utter loss of hope. Because no matter how bad it is, we have this hope that goes beyond where we are right now. We have this eternal hope, right? So Paul loves to talk about no matter how hopeless, we have hope. Because there's this hope that goes beyond where we are. And I don't understand how the world makes it sometimes. If you don't have that hope of understanding that the God who went to hell and took the keys of hell and death back with him and said, I own this now. So he's now and he's in charge of all of it. But we have that hope of serving that God that can forgive us of anything, that can redeem anything, that can qualify any disqualification. You understand that no matter how disqualified you are, he can qualify you. No matter how lost you are, he can find you. No matter how bad you messed up, he can forgive you. No matter how filthy you are, he can clean you. He's not the God of the tune-up. You understand that he's not the God of the tune-up. Therefore, I have made all things tuned up. He didn't say that. I have made all things new. All things new. Man, we got a van that is like, that van does not need a tune-up. That van needs to be made new. Okay? That van needs to be made new. Because you drive a new vehicle and you're like, yeah, that's what this van needs. Jesus has the ability to make all things new. Lord, Whoo, I need new. Lord, when things get tough, I repent of the times that I went back to the old when you made things new. Make me new. Remember that old song? Make me new, Lord Jesus, make me new. For it seems that in so many ways I'm not enough like you. Take this weary vessel I have been. 
and mold me once again. That implies that he's molded us. <laughs> <laughs> and I made it to where I needed to be remolded. He's, he's willing to do it more than once. Isn't that amazing? He'll do it more than once. And mold me once again. Change my heart. Change my spirit. Make me new. Man, could you imagine watching the Red Sea part? I picture a whale, like, bumping into the edge of the water, like, dude, what the heck is going on here? I'm trying to get there. And then the enemy trying to close in on us, and the waves crashing down, and then three days later or whatever it was, being mad because the spring water is bitter. Insane. It was better back there. But that's, we all have that. It's part of the human condition. Man. He molds us. He makes us new. And then the Bible talks like a dog returns to his vomit, so the, re the fool returns to their folly. You ever been foolish? I've been foolish. I've been foolish. These hard times have re revealed some foolishness that I thought wasn't there anymore. I'm like, oh, I thought we dealt with that. Oh, we did. But I got to mold you once again. <laughs> like that song says. I got to mold you once again. So we're perplexed but we're not in despair. And if you're feeling like you're in despair, it's okay. We'll just say it. Lord, I give back that despair. We'll just leave it, not in this basket, because we didn't. just find a different one. Leave the despair in a basket and bring back hope. Mold me once again. Mold me once again. Change my heart, change my spirit. Make, don't tune me up. Lord, I think we're past tune up right now, Okay. We're past tune-up. I need to be made new. How many people in this room need to be made new? Okay, it can happen now. It's going to happen. It's going to happen now. Lord, now. Start the process. Start. It's like when you turn the oven up. I can't just throw the pizza in. I got to heat it first. Like, Lord, warm us up. Because <laughs> we're going to throw a pizza in, and we're going to be made new in the name of Jesus. Oh, so it implies Paul's telling it's okay to be baffled. It's okay to look at this and go, man, this makes no sense. This is not what I thought this was going to be. However, I'm not going to forget who God is. Because that's what got Joseph through what happened in Potiphar's house and the prison. For him to be brought into that palace. There, there were years when, it when the, the, the palace moment seemed impossible. Like, and we're not even talking about the two dreams of his mom and his dad and his brothers bowing to him like you got at some point you got to well that's not going to happen there's no path to that from prison Are you kidding me my reputation's destroyed they think of me as someone that i doing something that i actually did the opposite so there had to be there's no road to the palace from the prison for joseph and but god right i mean he can make a way where there's no way so thank you lord that somehow you're going to make a way where it feels like there's no way in this, and we have to come. Have you heard of Henry Blackaby's workbook, Experiencing God? If you haven't, get it. It's not expensive. He has an entire ministry now built off of this one book he wrote, Experiencing God. And there is this chapter in there about the crisis of belief that is so amazing because we reach, the, the, the enemy has, a, by the way, the enemy has one plan for everything we go through. And God's like, I know, but I have a different plan. I have a different plan for this. So when we look around everything that's going on in our society, <laughs> everything that's going on with this disease, what the enemy's plan for this doesn't matter. I love what Pastor Frank shared in prayer on a Friday morning a few weeks ago. He said, quit getting caught up in the plot and focus on God's plan. The plot twist is less relevant than the plan. So I love that. I've been praying around that. It's so wise. By the way, it might be, if you can, get there on Fridays. It's really awesome. It's about 9 o'clock, I think, is when prayer starts. It's really good. If not, just pray another time. But that is really, really, we get, the, the plot sometimes has a way of distracting us from God's plan. And that's this right here. So the enemy has, I'm going to throw this plot twist in there, hopefully get them to forget about God's plan. It happened to John the Baptist. John the Baptist met Jesus and knew Jesus was the Messiah in the womb. 
when the two moms met, John the Baptist starts freaking out in the womb because he knows who the baby and the other womb is. And then when Jesus shows up to get baptized, John knew who he was. And the clouds parted, and a dove descends, and, and like a voice from hell, like, this is my son. Like, John the Baptist knew, and yet there was a moment when he's sitting in prison, he sends his disciples to Jesus and go, hey, are you really the one? So it happened to him, it's going to happen to us, and yet we're not going to lose sight, we're not going to lose hope. That was him going, I don't understand, but I care enough to, to make sure. Don't get more caught up in the plot than we are with God's plan. Frank Holland it should be on social media. You should really put that in social media. That's a really good post. But uh, seriously, that's a really good post. I see a little 30-second video about how to get more caught up in the plan than the plot. You should do it because it's a really good word. It's been, I hear a lot of good stuff I've been thinking about it for the last month. So thank you. All right, so, so what do we do? Like here we have this challenge. There was this sermon I heard, uh, it was on online. All these churches now are online. There's some really great content out there. They figured out a way to share their message with more people. Like w that's a great, by the way, byproduct of, of this COVID thing. Like, oh yeah, okay, well, we'll just get better at what we do then. Mark 4, 35 through 40. This is, now I've taught on the disciples in a boat in a storm. And this is another story about the disciples in a boat in a storm, but it's a different one. So Jesus just finished sharing all these parables, saying all this awesome stuff, and he's like, all right, let's get in this boat. We're going to go to the other side. That evening, that day at evening, Jesus said to his followers, come with me across the lake. So they left the crowd behind and went with Jesus in the boat he was already in. There were also other boats that went with them. A very bad wind came up on the lake. The waves were coming over the sides and into the boat, and it was almost full of water. <laughs> this time Jesus was with him, though. Jesus was inside the boat, sleeping with his head on a pillow. Man, I got to tell you, I, when I sleep and it's too warm, I sweat. And my pillow, I guess the sweat, I can't sleep with a pillow that's even sweaty. How do you sleep with a pillow in a boat that says it's mostly full of water. Like, I don't even know how you pull that off. That's peace, like all capital letters right there. What's that? It was one of those hotel pillows. It's not soft. It doesn't absorb anything. It's just pure plastic, you know. <laughs> it's like one of those things you find at a station casino somewhere. <laughs> it's floating on the water. It's made of plastic. Okay, all right. The followers went and woke him up, and they said, Teacher, don't you care about us? We're going to drown. Wow. Where were they in the hole? Perplexed, but not despair. <laughs> Equation, right? Where were they in that moment? Because they, they reached a point where they're like, this, this storm was so bad that it changed the way they even saw Jesus. Like, seriously, Jesus, what is wrong with you? Like, we're going through this storm. Like, you need to get less where you are in this moment, and more where I am. Like, Jesus looks at him, and he's like, seriously? All right, peace be still. And by the way, what's wrong with you guys? You, you still, you have no faith? And this is what he's referring to. This was not the first storm they'd been through in a boat together. They'd already seen him walk on water once. And so Jesus is like, seriously, guys? Like, like how many of these do we have to go through before you realize I have complete authority over the whole thing. I'll walk on those waves. I'll help you walk on those waves. I have so much authority, Peter can walk on those waves, then lose his authority and sink, and I'll pick him up, and we'll still walk on these waves together. These waves have no authority over Jesus. And so he's like, how many times do we have to go through this before you figure out this storm ain't got nothing on me? So maybe that's part of the point. Like, literally. How many of these things do I have to get in before I realize at the depth of the fibers of my being how much authority God actually has in these moments? So I can be confused. I don't know why the storm's happening. Like Jesus must like storms. I don't get it. But 
He's got all authority. So when are we going to get to the point where Jesus either walks on water or just talks to it and it all goes away? I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe he's going to spit on it and it'll stop. He did it to a blind guy once. I don't know how he's going to handle this, but I do know it's going to get handled. Does that make sense? So we go through storms enough to where we go, I, God, I don't, look, I don't understand, and I don't know how you're going to handle this, but I've been with you enough to where I do know you'll handle it. Does that make sense? And that's where Jesus was asking them to get. So we had this rule, we had this kind of saying when I was a kid, if the bus driver is freaking out and running to the back of the bus, it's time to worry. You know what I mean? Because if that dude is freaking out to the point where this bus is going to crash and we're all going to die, it's time to realize something's really, really, really wrong. So my level of stress should not be higher than Jesus's. You make, make sense? So here they are like, Jesus, wh what is your problem? Dude, wake up. We're all going to die. And you don't seem to even care. You'd... Teacher, don't you care about us? <laughs> Teacher, what, you don't love me anymore? You forgot about me? My well-being is not important to you anymore? That's a lot of statements made about the person and character of God in one question. What did they allow themselves to start believing about Jesus and about themselves to ask that question? You know what I mean? There's a lot of things you have to be willing to accept in order to phrase the question like that. So Paul's saying, it's one thing to come in and go, um, look, this one has me scared. This storm has me scared, and I don't know what's going on, so be, if you could help me. Can you tell me what's up? Can you give me strength? Is there something I'm missing? Should I be doing something different? Than, have I done something to bring this storm on? Like, there's a lot of questions to ask, but Jesus, at this point, he knew they were still at the point where they questioned who they were and who he was. And that storm did a pretty good job of iron sorting that out, didn't it? Because at the end, what's the question they asked? Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? The whole point of that story is what they really didn't understand about him or about themselves. Think of everything they had gone through with him, and they're still trying to figure out who he is. So if they can be there, I think it's okay for you to be honest about the the ways in which you're still there. Like, it, maybe it's just me, but I'm still, tr I'm still figuring out a little bit about who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him. I've never been in his presence like that, manifest, physically there, physically spitting in some dude's eyes and then he can see, physically walking on water. I haven't seen those things. And the Bible says it's one thing to see and believe. Blessed are those who haven't seen and still believe. I've seen God do some amazing things, by the way. So I, I, I'm one of those that's seen and believed. But if they're at that point where they're still trying to figure it out, okay, we're, we are too. Can you just admit that? Like we're still trying to figure out stuff that we don't yet know about what God's really like and how much authority he really has, because sometimes the storm can distract us from what things we thought were really settled in our hearts. Because you got Peter going, Jesus, I'll never betray you. I'll, I'm, look, we're good. But <laughs> circumstances changed, and the room changed, and suddenly the things he was saying changed. I don't know if you've been there, but I've been there. I haven't denied Jesus over it. I mean, like, I, I don't know him, but I've denied him in the way that I responded in moments of pressure versus moments of peace. Does that make sense? So these things, I don't know what the enemy's, per I don't know if the enemy brought the storm or if Jesus was like, you know what would really work right now is a really good storm. I don't know. It doesn't say, it just says the wind came up. I, it could have been just natural patterns of the moon and the sun and gravity and all that. It could have been, I don't know. It could have just been a storm that just came because it was already going to come. It could have been the storm that Jesus said, you know what, we need these guys to experience. It could have been the devil trying to keep them from, re I don't know, it doesn't say. But one thing I do know is that Jesus had a purpose when the storm came. So I don't know who brought it. 
I don't know. It does not say who brought that storm. All it says is what Jesus did about it and how he did, how he revealed to them something they still had to learn. Now, did he beat them up? Did he reject them? Did he say, when we get to the other side, I'm picking a whole new 12? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you know what? After all you guys seen, that's it. We're doing a new 12. I'm not going to let you drown, but when we get to the other side, we're doing a reorg. We're doing a whole reorganization. Judas, I need a new CFO. No, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. So it's clearly he wasn't talking to them that way in a way to reject them or in a way to get them to hate themselves as much as he hated them. That wasn't the purpose at all. He's literally trying to help them see him differently and help them see them differently. Because he wanted, he literally wanted them to hear themselves ask that question, don't you care about us? You ever wonder? Come on, seriously. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever gone through something so dark and so long, so desperate? Like, am I the Lord? Jesus did it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay. So, yeah, I've been there. I've been there. I mean, and not 25 years ago, but I'm here now to tell you. No, okay. <laughs> Pretty recently. Lord, seriously, am I just cursed? Like Naomi, when she's talking to Ruth, she's like, no, no, no. God is completely against me now. I didn't reach quite that part. But I'm like, seriously, why is this happening? Lord, are you there? Are you, do, you, do you even hear me now? You ever been there? I've been there. And so Jesus sometimes just needs us to hear us say that because it's not a new attitude. It's just a new verbally expressed statement. They had that problem before the storm. It just took the storm to melt them down to the point they had no other verbiage to turn to than, okay, let's just cut to the chase. I think you don't care about me anymore. You know what I mean? So G so that heart mindset toward him was there in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not like they just, so it just exposed, it revealed this misunderstanding about Jesus that he's like, okay, great, now we can talk about it. By the way, peace be still. So here we are. So I wanted to talk to you just about challenge. God offers up a challenge. Guys, let's go to the other side together. He challenges us to become a part of something he's going to do and reach the other side. And then the enemy challenges that resolve with a storm. And then Jesus challenges us to become more like him in whatever that challenge revealed about us that's not yet fully redeemed. Does that make sense? So Jesus offers a challenge. Guys, let's go do this together. Everybody, anybody who wants to come, hop in. We're going to go over there. So they get on board. And then the resistance come. Now there's a challenge. There's this resistance. There's this thing coming against them, which is, it's three challenges in the process. And then Jesus uses what we, what's revealed in us to challenge us to go, hey, you know what? You need to change your faith. You need to actually reach a point where you realize I have all authority over these storms because more storms are coming. It wasn't like this was the last storm. He wouldn't have needed them to learn anything if that was the last storm that was ever going to come. My ho his hope was that they would learn this about him so that when he's crucified, they would understand that's a storm too. Does that make sense? Because someday there's going to come a storm that's going to cause you to question everything I've ever taught you, everything you ever thought I was as the Messiah. And I'm going to need you to understand me well enough to endure that storm too. Right? Right? Yeah. So what is this storm preparing us for? I just want each person to just take a minute here, and I'm almost done. Like, seriously, three minutes. What questions are you asking of God right now? What are you asking of God right now? It might not be, Lord, do you love me? Do you not care about me? It could be, Lord, did you really say this? Lord, did you really promise me this? Lord, did you really call me to this? 
what are the questions right now in your hardship that you have a tendency to ask of God? Or was that real when you showed up and you healed me? Or was that real? Did you really bring us together? Lord, did you really provide this to us? Lord, is this really of you? Like there's a question we start to ask of God when things get really hard. I'd like you to just remind yourself of what that question is. One. And two, the Bible talks about, it it says, it uses fancy language. It says, hold every thought captive and force it into submission to Christ. What that means is, identify that thing you're thinking and ask Jesus what he thinks about it. (laughs) That's what it means. It's a fancy way of saying that. So what is it? What's the thought of the question you're asking of God when things get really hard and you don't know what's going on? And you reach that point where you're befuddled and on the way to despair. What's that question? Two, what does God really think about that? Because that's the weapon we have is what God really says. Jesus has the authority to quiet the storm, but his real purpose, the real miracle, is when he uses that storm to cause us to think differently about him and us. So in what way is what you're going through purposed by God to cause you to think differently? Does that make sense? So Lord, what am I thinking? And Lord, what are you thinking? Really what it comes down to. Because here, David killed a lion, killed a bear, but guess what? Goliath was more scary. Because the whole Israelite army would have taken on a bear. The whole Israelite army would have taken on a lion. But none of those soldiers trying to take on Goliath. That was a bigger problem. So David looked at it differently when he's in front of Saul. He said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. And the same God that helped me do that is going to help me do this. So here's the third question. Lord, what are the things you've already done in my life that should give me faith for this? Because that's what Jesus was referring to. Guys, we've been through this. We've literally been in a boat that was going to sink in a storm and dealt with it then. And now we're in a boat with a sinking in a storm and we'll deal with it now. So what is it that he's already helped you deal with that should give you faith that he's going to help you now? So three questions. Lord, what am I starting to ask about you when things get hard? Two, what do you have to say about this situation? And three, what have you already done in my life that can give me faith for this one? Because that's the power of our testament. God, I can never forget what you've done in my life. Because if you forget what he's done in your life, you'll, you'll let go of what he's about to do. Okay, that should be in your Twitter. If you forget what he's already done in your life, you'll lose hope for what he's about to do. So remember it. <laughs> Write it down. I killed a lion, I killed a bear, and I'm going to kill this giant too. It's a vile Philistine standing in the way of the army of God. Amen? I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I ask that there's someone here today, that everyone here heard something they needed to hear from you, no matter what it was. Lord, we're in it. We're not in the same boat, but we're in the same storm in so many ways. And so, Lord, I just ask that you'll speak to the hearts and minds of every person here, that we would not leave with despair, we would leave with faith and promise and authority. I feel the Lord asking me to ask you, when you walk out of here, what are you walking in? Are we walking in question marks? Are we walking in doubt? Are we walking in pain? Are we walking in hurt? Are we walking in authority? Because Jesus spoke with authority to that storm and he's giving you all authority. So what are we walking out with? What garment are we gonna put on? In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I just ask that you would encourage the hearts of every person here that this word would sink in. Lord, that every person here would encourage their pastor this week. Every person here, Lord, would grab hold of who you really are in the name of Jesus.